I, for example, think the markets could do a sub 2000 swan dive pretty, pretty easily. We are going to discover where all the bodies are, uh, like in Lake Mead, when, when, when the liquidity drains away and there, the, there are the bodies. Um, and, and why the markets haven't responded to what I see is just risk in every direction, a 360 degree radius, I see risk, whether it's political, geopolitical, economic. I mean, I think the economy is rolling over. I don't think the economy is healthy at all. I say that gold in ancient Rome bought a month's worth of manual labor. Mm. So $2,300 gold would buy uh, $2,300 of labor, which manual labor times 12, right? You're, you're kind of up there around, you know, what you'd pay a laborer in the modern era. He now knows where the spoons are. He knows who he can trust. When he puts a guy as Secretary of Defense, he's going to know who he's putting in Secretary of Defense. He's had plenty of time to build alliances. He now knows where the forks and spoons are in Washington. And so I think, you know, I have mixed emotions whether I'd like to see him go Leroy Jenkins on his, on his political opponent. What I think y'all ought to prepare for is the kind of thing that will pass and you have to decide how long you're willing to sort of hedge against so hedging for a month is easy hedging for six months that takes some serious thought and hedging for the society's never coming back is a totally different game which i'm not going near hey guys welcome back to capital cosm today we've got the one and only dave column Dave, <laughs> can you coming on? I see a bar in front of me. Wait a minute. Okay. Oh, oh. no, the, the, the bar was telling me it was being recorded. It was covering my face. Um, hi, how are you doing now? Good, now we man. got it. Yeah. You know, good, man. How are you? I, I'm doing okay. All things considered. <clears throat> uh, how's your voice, by the way? Are you sick or something? Um, that was a little phlegm ball in there, but I think I dealt with it. Okay. Well, hey guys, before we get started, I'd like to remind you to hit that subscribe button if you're enjoying the content on this channel. Uh, it takes less than a second and uh, it's free. So if you don't mind helping me out, hit that subscribe button. Okay, Dave, let's just go ahead and dive right in. What is your economic overview at the moment? Say your 40,000 foot view of the economy. Well, it's, um, I'm like, I'm the most bearish guy in the planet, best I can tell. I, I sent an, a, a DM one day to Hussman and Felder on Twitter. And I said, I said, I know maybe a half a dozen people who who can see the potential downside risk in the markets um, of the magnitude that, that most can't fathom. And, and, and three of those six are in this DM message right now. And uh, and so I I uh, I don't think it'll necessarily be fast. I'm not a believer in crashes as corrective me measures because crashes always get bought. They they always get bought, and um, and you get short sellers buying the bottom, and next thing you get these wild as as Stockman would say paroxysms, and, and so it races back up as people try to cover their shorts and people try to catch the momentum. So, so I think the real correction of this market, which has been, in my opinion, out of balance for, uh, for approximately, actually almost exactly uh, 30 years, uh, I think will be much more of a Nikkei-like, you know, the beatings will continue until the morale improves kind of moment, period of time. I think we'll look up several decades from now and realize we didn't go anywhere. Um, with that stated, that's not the economy, but the economy looks like a disaster too. Commercial real estate looks like it's in a disastrous decline, meaning it's not just a cyclical dip, in my opinion, but but somehow society may have changed. Now that might not be true because I, you know, I don't know how to run a, a business that works out of a 60-story high rise in Manhattan. But um, but but I wouldn't be shocked if 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 the demand for commercial real estate never recovered to the level that the uh, that the guys who created the commercial real estate anticipated, COVID kind of changed that. Zoom changed that. There's, you know, I, I, my son works at the Council on Foreign Relations, and they they don't fly in everyone anymore, right? They have the Zoom group, and they have the people who are there, and um, save a lot of money not using commercial real estate, um, and then. 
you can't convert it to uh, you can't convert it to condos. Uh, uh, and I didn't I, I knew that was true. And then I actually read an article the other day that talked about how some guy who actually assesses that sort of looks at the facility and says, what can we do with this? And approximately 25 percent of the facilities he looks at look amenable to condoization is a, a, my term, not his. And, and then the question comes, well, what happens to those buildings? And it kind of hit me the other day when Jim Kunstler said, what do they disassemble them? What do you, what do you do now? If it's Detroit, you just let it be a burned out wreck of some kind, you know, but, but in the middle of Manhattan, a 60 story office building that's unoccupied or should we say unoccupied, unoccupied by legal, legal, um, legal members of society um they could be occup occupied by by illegal immigrants um what do you do with them I, I don't know it's actually a rather vexing question um possibly it's not a problem possibly it'll just refill and everything will ba go back to normal but i worry about that um we've got a huge amount of uh, uh underbrush to burn off that's collected over the last uh dozen years of excessive monetary policy. Um, I'm the only guy who doesn't blame the Fed for keeping the rates too high for, for a long time because they kept the rates too low for too long, too many times over the last three decades. And so they have created their own monster. And now we've got to pay the price. And, you know, my son told me yesterday, my son is a starving musician. The bank of dad lends him money never to be paid back. Um, he said he bought groceries the other day. He's in Boston. And he carried them back from his apartment, one bag. And he said that, and I, I sort of grilled him on what was in the grocery bag. It wasn't, it wasn't ribeye. It wasn't, you know, it was ground turkey for the protein sort of thing and vegetables, stuff like that. He said it was $157. And, and I, I don't know how people who are in the the average and below income brackets are paying for their groceries. I don't know how they're paying. I went to the store and I've seen cheaper turkey since then, but I went to a Tops, which is a standard grocery store. It's not some elite deli in midtown Manhattan. Um, and there were about six different kinds of turkey. And I remember I used to pay four something a pound for this. Not too many years ago. I mean, it was, uh, and, and it was $13.99 a pound for all six. And that's just, uh, that's filet mignon prices in the not too distant past. And so, um, so everything's way the hell up. And I, I, again, I'm in pretty good shape. So I just feel the discomfort from it, from an abstract position where I go, this sucks, right? So I, I go, I can't believe this costs this much. But I, I don't know how the people who say, look, I don't know where I'm going to get the money to pay for this stuff. And there's an awful lot of people who are in that situation, I think. And if they want to buy a house, forget it. The, 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 the price of owning this, the same house has roughly doubled. If you, if you get a mortgage under the new mortgage rates and things like that. And I don't think the Fed should take the rates down. I, 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 I'm in a, a, a minority of one, I think, who thinks that, no, I think a, I think a 5% Fed funds rate is a pretty credible rate. And the fact that uh, society wants more, I, I don't care. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, I, I think 5% is a totally reasonable rate to, to, to lend out money. And, uh, so they shouldn't bail everything out. Yeah, fastest rate hiking cycle in history. You had gold's making new all-time highs. Markets been making new all-time highs. It begs the question: What would it be had it not been you know, for these rate rate hikes? You know, we would be in crazy inflationary territory had it not been. Well, two of those three should correlate, and that is that um, you know people say when you know when when the Fed starts dropping rates or whatever, you know that that's when that's when gold will soar. Well, I, to the extent that interest rates in general and gold in general responds to inflation, which is not a very tight correlation, but to the extent they do, they should both go up when there's inflation on the horizon, right? And so in the seventies, they both went up. And mm -hmm. so this idea that, that, that they should inversely correlate doesn't make sense to me. They're both, they're both responding to the same, the same parameter.
So, yes. So so higher for longer. That's kind of like the camp that you're in. Uh, so very much actually, so. Yeah. Do you do you actually think that they'll go? No. Uh, they'll actually go along with it though. I think they'll go along with it longer than people think. I think that they're going to go along with it until people are in pain. In fact, again, Powell used the word pain multiple times. There's nothing going on right now that would be described as painful. This is this is not. There's not blood in the streets. There's not the houses are not on fire. Um, one could argue that underneath the surface, the credit market is probably a, in a bit of a shambles. Is my guess. Um, there's no Doris Dungy to tell us this yet, but, but yeah, you get people like Melody Wright talking about the private debt market and what a monster that is. And it's unregulated and unmeasurable almost. So people are only guessing how big it is, but it's very big. Um, we are going to discover where all the bodies are, uh, like in Lake Mead when, when, when the liquidity drains away and they're, the, they're the bodies. Um, and and why the markets haven't responded to what I see is just risk in every direction, a 360 degree radius. I see risk, whether it's political, geopolitical, economic. I mean, I think the economy is rolling over. I don't think the economy is healthy at all. Um, the, the metrics that are big and important enough to, 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 to commit fraud to make them look good because it's an election year, those, those might seem okay. But uh, but if you look at sort of the below the radar kind of metrics where you talk to some guy in pharma and he says, as best I can tell, no pharmaceutical industry is hiring anyone right now, you know, and they're not even supposed to be recession sensitive. And so there, there's there's if you look at ones that are too, the, the metrics are too small to rig because there's too many of them of that magnitude. They all say they're rolling over. I once was chatting with Steph. Tomboy, and she said, even the big numbers are getting hard to rig. She says, even the obvious ones, you know, they keep doing the, you know, employment numbers um, and then doing the revisions from the previous month. And they're dropping like stones, or the, the, the original numbers are good, and then the revisions drop. I think Powell probably wants, he, he may want the good numbers to hold up so that he can keep his foot on the brakes longer. I'm not sure he's in a rush to find numbers to justify um, juicing, juicing the system. Now, where people are completely clueless, and it's astonishing, it reminds me of this idea of, you know, economists didn't believe stagflation was possible. And I'm going, wait a minute, so I can buy half as much with my, pay, with my paycheck, and that's not stagnating for the economy. I mean, that strikes me as insane that they would miss that little detail. But the other one is that if you actually superimpose the Fed funds right on top of the S&P, which has been done probably 10,000 times on the internet, um, what you find is, is that the top is usually marked by the first rate cut. Mm. The market peaks within a few months of the first rate cut. And then uh, throughout the entire rate cutting cycle, the market is tanking. That was true for 0809, was true for 2000, 2003. And you can almost mark the bottom when the Fed's done cutting rates, even though the problem now is they'll cut them down to zero. And so, you know, that's not even a metric anymore. Zero percent interest rates is absurdity to me. Um, here's a question I like to ask people. I'll ask you. I might have already, so you might already have an answer. Um, Imagine I, they offered you a 30-year treasury and they said, how you got to hold it for 30 years, though. It's locked in. It's like a private equity deal or something. And you're, you're guaranteed to be paid to the extent that the United States is guaranteed to pay, right? And, and 30 years is a long time, but most people would probably say, okay, that bet's probably okay. Um, and... The fictional part is you're not allowed to hedge it. You're not allowed to sell it. Now, every other in the real world, you can do that. But let's just say, look, I'm offering you a revenue stream, an annuity for the next 30 years. But you have to hang on to it and you got to commit serious money to it. What interest rate? Not, not knowing the future, what interest rate would you demand? That is a good question. Right. Um, I'd probably call for... Uh... 
Right. Some people say 20. I say, well, you get your money back in five years. So that's a, that's too much, right? Yeah. But 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 ten percent, yeah, you get your money back in in um, in uh, ten years, and uh, and and it tells you therefore that the thirty-year treasury is mispriced because that thirty-year treasury will be floating around out there, paying off half that, less than half of that, for the next thirty years. And the question is, why is it mispriced? Well, we talked the Saudis into buying them. We talked the Chinese into buying them. We have various statutory restrictions on what pensions can do and what what insurance companies can do and what banks can do. And so we've guaranteed we we had guaranteed buyers, and so we had an artificial market in that sense. And then, of course, you got QE shit going on. So, you know, when they don't like where it's at, they do that. But that, that's relatively new. But the point being is, is if it was really a free market, if, if the most important market in the history of capitalism, the market where buyers and lenders haggle over the price of capital, right? You can't get more foundational than that. If that's broken, you've got a problem. And it's broken. I mean, it's it's highly flawed. No one would take that offer at five percent. No one. Yeah. And so, so it means it's priced wrong. And people say, well, people don't hang on to treasuries. I go, someone's not going to own it. That's out there. So maybe you'll dump it. Maybe you'll time it. Maybe you'll do whatever. <clears throat> but it's 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 going to be out there, and it's going to be serving up its low percentage for the next thirty years. It's going to be like this thing, you know, space probe going off into the black void, just kicking out four plus change percent. What is the 30 year treasury out right now? What's the return, you know? Not off the top of my head. Yeah. It's it's somewhere in four or five, I think. Yeah. Um the yield curve's still inverted. It's it didn't go it, it went pretty deeply inverted, but more importantly, and I've asked people if this matters, because I yeah, I don't know for sure because it's very hard to know a fact. Um does it matter how long a yield curve is inverted? What's the history on that? And it's been in, inverted for the, a record period of time. Yeah, the longest period of time. And and so then the question is, what does that mean? Is that a, is that potential energy building up in the yield curve? Yeah. And and when it uninverts, the uninversion for those who have not been paying attention uh, is the point where the markets basically shit the bed. That's when the, the economy sits the bad. It's the it's when it inver, uninverts supposedly is the, the period when the risk soars. I, I must confess, I don't quite know why that is. I could make up a story, but I, I someone like Chris Whalen or something would say, "Well, actually, Dave, you know, I, I, nice try, but that's bullshit." Here's the reason. So, but I don't know why the D inverted. Maybe I'll ask Twitter and get someone to tell me. Um, it doesn't so, point side with the fact that. That's typically when the Fed starts cutting rates, which is a bearish signal. Uh, it, yeah, that could be. And I've thought about that. Um, the because, other thing I mean, is you, you kind of alluded to it at the very beginning when the Fed cuts rates, that's when bearish because it's fan. like, yeah, it's like yeah, you go to a doctor panicking. and then they recommend and then they prescribe you medicine. Well, that's that's right. That's your right. It, you're it you're sick. You're sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, oh, by the way, we're going to give you chemotherapy. Oh, okay. Let me see if I got. Yeah, you're not going right. to say. Oh, yes, uh, it's bullish for my health. Yeah. Right. Oh, by the way, someone claimed the other day, and a prominent person I won't name because I'm not sure it's right, and I don't want to make them look like assholes. But a person who I would like to think knows what they're doing said that 70 percent of the GDP is healthcare now. Does that seem right? Wait, 70, wait, seven zero? 70. Seven zero is what I heard. Of course, I'm also going deaf, which is part of the healthcare problem. Um, hmm. But let's say it's not 70. Let's just say it's a big number now because the boomers are getting old. It, wait, isn't, isn't government, uh, the government or the GDP? The See, that's the GDP funny race, thing. Like, that's 50%. If the like government, 50 if they say consumer spending is 70%. That's the yeah. 70 anchor, right? That's the 70 anchor. Maybe they include that in consumer spending. And so 60 percent, 70 percent health care and, and another 10 percent. Who knows? But let's just say health care is a huge percentage of GDP, because if you look around, every town has new health care facilities that have been built and stuff. And, and it, it, it turns out that's not GDP, in my opinion. That is uh, that is the cost of a depreciating asset. And if you think it's GDP, if you actually think it's product, 
then I have to ask you this. If there was no need for any health care whatsoever, would we be better off? And the answer is yes. And if I said, look, if there are no cars, you'd say, no, we'd be worse off. But if I say there's no health care, if, if you're all healthy, um, if you own a brand new car, you're better off than if you than if you have a 1980 Corvair and you're dropping 3000 a month to keep it on the road. So we are, the boomers are a rapidly depreciating asset. And to the extent that we're flailing to keep us alive, that's not, that's not product. That's, that's depreciation. That, that's the shit you write down, right? When a company depreciates an asset, mm-hmm. they, they write it down over 20 years or however many number of years they want to write it down over. So, 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 so healthcare, should, the world would be a better place if there was no need for healthcare. Yeah. So I don't consider that gross domestic product, which it's a tax. It is a tax on the system. Ultimately, healthcare is a response to uh, yeah, negative health, to bad health, to to eating too many too many ice cream cones and things like that. Or in this case, now eating anything. I mean, you look at the ingredient packet, like the ingredient oh section, God, yeah. like behind any food product that you buy, it's like all these things you can't even pronounce. Well, that's all part of, by the way, the inflationary. The hidden inflation. I've been a big fan of hidden inflation. I know even Biden, who clearly doesn't get much anymore, mentioned shrinkflation, and he's blaming companies. He says they're doing it to us. I, you know, what a moron! Everyone knows about. Well, why didn't they do it before then? Like if it was just well, they did. Like Actually, they yeah. did. They did. They but uh, you know the, the the candy bars and and stuff like that. They they, they cycle. You get they, they get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then all of a sudden they offer you a big grab bag. Yeah. Oh, the the big grab, and then that'll shrink down, and that's that that's an infinite cycle. That's an infinite loop. So that's not even new, and and it's not that clever to spot. You know, the inflation that I've been obsessing over for for at least a decade is the um is the fact that they hedonically adjust uh, Boskin and his nitwits hedonically adjusted for um for quality. So, for example, if you buy a blender now and it's got twice as many buttons, they say, well, that's a better blender. And therefore, right. it's actually cheaper, right? They they do un- another adjustment, which has been bugging the shit out of me, called substitution, mm-hmm. where they say that uh, if you're eating um, if you're eating roast beef, sliced roast beef, and it gets too expensive, you go down to sliced turkey. And what they do... They what what seems to have been overlooked, at least I haven't seen it. And I think I would have noticed it is that by virtue of the fact that sliced turkey is cheaper than sliced roast beef, according to the market pricing of those two goods, the substitution should be precisely offset by a hedonic adjusted inferior product. Yep. Side, if you have to drop from prime rib to ground beef, you're getting a worse product, and therefore the substitution. Well, they're getting the be best used. of both worlds in, in that scenario. Because well, they don't, and so yeah. so in fact, the substitution should not exist as a as a corrective measure, which they do. Are you in the market for gold and silver? Then, if so, please consider Miles Franklin. They are my gold and silver dealer of choice. So not only do they have super competitive prices that you're going to have a really hard time finding elsewhere, but then they also have top notch customer support. I know Andy Sheckman, the owner of Miles Franklin top-notch guy. I wouldn't be recommending them to you if I didn't have faith in their product. But what, what you really want to do, however, you want to email them at info at milesfranklin.com and you want to say that Capital Cosm sent me in the description line because when you do that, you can get access to their special pricing sheet. You want to get that special pricing sheet because you're going to get special prices that you won't find on the website itself. So email them at info at milesfranklin.com Tell them that Capital Cosm sent you and you won't be heckled with spam emails, etc. There's no commitment necessary. I promise you that. And with that said, I will let you get back to the video. But the, the one that's been bugging unless me the most. Unless you hedonically adjust it. Unless you hedonically adjust it. Like you, well, and then it erases it. Yeah. So the, so the substitution just gets negated by hedonic adjustment. So, so what's been bothering me though is, is, is what I call, uh, you know, accelerated depreciation. So one day I broke a blender. My favorite example, I broke a blender. One of these ones, if you drop it on your foot, you'd be in the ER because you'd have broken bones, right? One of those. And I, 
I broke the glass part and it's, it was probably 40 years old, 50 years old. You buy a modern blender instead of lasting 50 years, it's going to last five years. And I actually did that experiment and it lasted about three years. And yet, yet the inflation metrics don't include um, the accelerated depreciation of these things. And so, so in theory, let's say it goes from, you know, lasting 50 years to five years. In theory, that's a, that's in a 90% erosion due to inflation. And that's getting missed by the inflation metrics. So when you buy a car and you need to fix it, you no longer can just have the guy, you know, open up the part and pull out some plastic piece and pull out some pieces to add a new piece. You have to replace the whole unit. Things are very expensive. They they don't. Some things are unfixable. How many how many electronic devices when they break you fix? And so there's a sure, huge yeah. accelerated depreciation, and that is a highly inflationary contribution that never gets counted. As far as I know, maybe the economists are smarter than I think, but in fact, they really should be smarter than I think, since my opinion is pretty low. Is gold an inflation hedge, in your opinion? Uh, long term it is, but it you know if if you're using it as an inflation hedge in the one or two year window, it's not. But gold, gold has you know the favorite saying is an ounce of gold buys a, a good suit. But but suits, yeah, how do you think about what a good suit is? They say back to ancient Rome, and I go, so I, you're telling me you know how to compare a toga to a three piece suit from Brooks Brothers? What do you? I, that makes no sense. The one that does make sense is they say that gold in ancient Rome bought a month's worth of manual labor. Mm. So $2,300 gold would buy uh, $2,300 of labor, which manual labor times 12, right? You're, you're kind of up there around, you know, what you'd pay a laborer in the modern era. Interesting. So unskilled labor would, would run about an ounce of gold. Um, and in that sense, gold, since it started trading in the U S again, I think if I remember correctly, something like seven and a half percent per year compounded. I mean, if you told me, if you said now I'll give you seven and a half percent return on an investment guaranteed, I'd probably take that as long as I could sell it. <laughs> right. When I didn't like the idea, but yeah. um, is, is gold returning back to a, to a settlement currency of sorts as the dollar, you know, the, the, the position that the treasury, the U S the U S treasury once had, or currently does have, will that kind of be the role that gold partakes in again? Uh, I don't know. So the battle now seems to be, there's like a five way, six way battle, you know, clearly China wants the, I don't even how to say the two words, Juan and Remimbi. They certainly would like to have the the dominant currency. Um, e Europeans want the euro. Um, Arabs have at one point suggest they go back to gold. The next thing they know, drones are dropping bombs on them from the sky. Um, That's what happened to Gaddafi too. Yeah, right. The BRICS. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't don't say you're going to go off the dollar standard. The BRICS, I think, are the most interesting risk, and in that the BRICS went from four countries of considerable consequence um, to now they're saying 30 ish and they don't have a currency yet. And the easiest way for them to, to create a currency would just say, let's go with gold. Right. Cause it's already exists. So we'll, we'll exploit that. Right. Um, why, why invent a new one when we can just do a gold backed whatever um, more important in the BRICS story, and I, was, I had a long talk with Steve Hankey one day, who's a currency expert, and, and, um, and I said, Steve, 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 tell me, the BRICS is not about a currency. The BRICS is about alliances. He said, absolutely. So you've got 30 countries saying we're no longer hanging out with the cool kids over the United States. We're going with Russia, China, India, Brazil. And, and there's now 30 countries, including Saudi Arabia, which now we're talking about the Saudis being bad guys. So you can hear the drums of war starting on Saudi Arabia. And I think we're saying, don't don't think about it. You've got the petrodollar. Don't make us come and drop bombs on your head. And um, which I don't think will work, by the way. Um, so if, the, if 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 30 countries are saying we're going to change our alliances, that's, that's, that is not to be sneezed at. Uh, that's a serious problem. And, um, 
And so that could be a currency. You know, there could be there could be a currency emerging from that ooze. Um, and nobody seems to know. Everyone has an opinion, and no one seems to know how much gold China has. Now, China, some say they they store their gold like I store my fish. I I live on a lake, and I I store them in the lake. Um, China says that you know their gold is owned by their citizens. So China supposedly has encouraged citizens. What's also true, though, is no one knows, no one seems to know what the official China gold reserves are. But if China and Russia and India and these guys are buying up gold as fast as it can be produced without perturbing the price too much, one sense that maybe they're saying, look, if we do this sort of quietly, we'll we'll get more gold per per unit of paper currency. Um, one could even imagine the occasional smash and grab on the metal being China trying to reset the price for themselves, something like that. But but at some point, all of a sudden, gold could become the, the, the world reserve currency because China, Russia, and 28 other countries say it is. How fast and can something so, like that happen, though? I don't know. I'm not, that's so far outside my skill set. Let's go ahead and shift know. over to geopol- geopolitics then. What's kind of like your overview of the geopolitical makeup? Uh, it's kind of uh, to kind of put something to the forefront. Uh, Poland today uh, s- sent out a, or I think their Minister of Defense sent out a press release saying that Poland needs to be ready for full armed conflict with Russia. And yeah, Poland's uh, a problem. A couple of weeks ago, the Serbian president says, um, as crazy as this may sound, but Prepare for World War Three in two to three months. Right, I, that's that's more reasonable because they haven't actually pointed to the bad guy. Pol- Poland um, guys like Sikorsky, who has a lot of pull over there, um, they're dangerous. They're sort of they're sort of Europe's neocons, I think. Um, whereas Viktor Orban of Hungary is hanging on by his nails, trying to keep hungry from getting sucked into all these bad ideas. So uh, I'm a big Viktor Orban fan. Um, I'm a Maloney fan. I'm I'm probably a Marine Le Pen fan. I really don't know her as much. I might have just said I endorsed Adolf Hitler by mistake, but uh, I don't know her enough to know if I just did. I put out a tweet this morning, by the way, that clicked. I don't know why it it took this long. You know how an idea moves from your head to your gut and all of a sudden you just have it? You go, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I realize that that the Democrats who are using all this hyperbolic language about the true catastrophe of Trump becoming president and the hyperbole is ridiculous because, well, for starters, um, he was president for four years already and he, he didn't destroy anything. Right. Um, maybe he will this time, but, you know, maybe Biden will this time, too. So you just don't know. Um, I'd bet on Biden. Um, but but if they really believe that he was the next Adolf Hitler and that this is the end of democracy if he gets reelected, they could go with Kennedy and they won't. So it means they're lying sacks of garbage. They're liars, the pundits, the thought leaders, the cultists who have Trump derangement syndrome. They're just liars. Kennedy's sitting right in front of them. Kennedy could beat Trump. Do you and think they, they will? They will they won't Will they replace it. Biden? I was looking at a, a I have no idea. Of polls. Yeah, I was looking at a series of polls. They uh, they did a head to head between Trump and Biden. Trump comes up plus three on that. They also did a head to head between Trump and Harris. Trump comes up plus six on that. I would Trump put versus... a zero on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think the three three and six percent. I think that I think they're rigging the polls. I think Trump yeah. owns. But those be guys. that as it may. I mean, right. same time you know, same time four years ago. Uh, Trump was trailing Biden. Trump was trailing Clinton uh, eight years ago, same time. Um, so the fact that Trump's actually ahead in these polls, uh, I think it, it's it's quite it's quite resonating because typically look, you have it's the other way around. Look, the fact that a, that a major party in the United States is willing to put a guy who is completely incapable of doing the job just to win the election shows you how pathological that party has become. Now, I'm going to give the Republicans credit. Let's for laughs. I'm I'm Trump adjacent. Trump doesn't bother me. I think he actually did better than I expected. 
I think he he did it in under adverse conditions where he had neither party backing him. He didn't know who he could trust. He was in a constant war zone all the time during those four years. He now knows where the spoons are. He knows who he can trust. When he puts a guy as Secretary of Defense, he's going to know who he's putting in Secretary of Defense. He's had plenty of time to build alliances. He now knows where the forks and spoons are in Washington. And so I think, you know, I have mixed emotions whether I'd like to see him go Leroy Jenkins on his on his political opponents, because I think they were treasonous in their the things they did to try to give him trouble. I think I think it's the most treasonous thing I've ever seen. Maybe somewhere in the Civil War, you can find something more treasonous. But pretty much I'd, I'd give the January 6, post January 6 treatment of those guys, treason, uh, weaponization of the DOJ treason. Um, I don't know what the formal definition of treason is, but but my definition, I'd be happy to find the guys who did it and hang them from the nearest tree. And and um, if I had a loved one in prison from January 6th because he walked through the Capitol, I'd find out who most was responsible and go cap his ass. I, I, it's just that simple. Um, and so uh, and so. Um, I, so so. So I, I do want to see Trump, but 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 if if they really thought that Trump was a problem and this wasn't just some game, they would put Kennedy in there because he can do it. But they don't want Kennedy. So Trump's Hitler, but they don't want Kennedy. What kind of game is that? Right. If you got a choice of uh, Hitler versus Maloney, you go, oh, go with Maloney. You know, I, I mean, <laughs> it just but they don't want that. They, so, mm-hmm. so he's not Hitler. It's just hyperbole. They talk about how much he lies and how what a fascist he is, while they themselves are a bunch of fascists. Joe Scarborough, you know, he, I, 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 he should just boost himself every month until we get the biological effect we need. Um, so I've, I've had enough of the Democrats, uh, not the average Joe on, on the street who somehow is still not able the leadership, to leadership. Yeah. Yeah, the leadership, the guys who serve. If I was a Democrat, I'd be so mad that they handed me Biden and Harris. If if if, if you recall back, at, I think it was the Iowa caucuses. There was a debate where Biden was on the far left back in 2020. And Harris was closer to the middle, which tells you that the far left is the first who doesn't matter, as Trump told Rand Paul one day. Um, and. And and then Tulsi Gabbard in two minutes brought Kamala Harris to her knees with a with a with a, a withering attack, and Biden was on the far left and uh, looking like he's there just to make it look like there's an, an adult somewhere in the room, right? That, because it gets like Beto and just crazies. If you had said what are the odds of a Biden Harris administration, it would have been one in a thousand. The two biggest losers on that stage somehow ended up in office, which shows you that there, there's something wrong. There's something fundamentally wrong. So if I were a Democrat, I'd be so mad that they didn't figure out how to find some leadership. And, you know, I, I didn't like some things that Obama did, but I didn't hate Obama. I didn't like his foreign policy. But I'm reading Scott Horton's book right now and. Horton tells a horror story of U.S. foreign policy. It's just a horror story, and it's called Enough Already. And I, I realized I did a podcast with Scott back in 2018. I'd forgotten about it. But, um, but, but he, in his book, he describes both Trump and Biden um, and um, Obama basically getting bullied by the, by the hawks into capitulating. They, they tried not not to do the bad shit they did. And I don't remember Trump doing a lot of bad shit, but he he, he continued with shit that he could have stopped. Um, if Trump gets in office day one, I want to see the January 6th guys, all of them get pardoned. Day two, I want to see him announce that there's no more money going to Ukraine ever again until, that, until they find a way to sit at the table with Putin and solve this problem. Um, and then day three, you know, deal with the Department of Ed- Education and get rid of all the socialists in there. So there's there's this. And, and day four, start building a wall. How, how does a 
an economy look like between a Trump and a Biden presidency? Like, how does a Trump economy look like 2025 and beyond? And a Trump, and a Trump um, I think it's going to be a tough economy for both. I think the president's a victim of circumstance on the economy. Mm. I, I mean, Trump could blow it as badly as Biden because of his narcissism. And his desire to use the, the tools of finance to pump, pump and dump shit. So that's the part of Trump I liked the least when he was president was the fact that he was always pushing and pushing and pushing to keep the stock market going up. That, that just I, it bo that bothered me a lot. What about so, from a what about from a geopolitical front? Do you think he'd actually be better for? You know, to, at preventing wars, um, you did see. Oh this, yeah! Oh yes! You, oh yes! You, so you, oh yes! You did see this bill pass a couple of weeks ago, um, call, uh, making it automatic to enlist in the draft for eighteen to twenty-six year olds, um, and they've actually that that, it out to that women, actually to women just, too. Well, I think it should be women. There's plenty of jobs that don't require putting them in a trench on the front lines. So one of the things Giuliani did when he was mayor of New York is he got the cops out from behind desks and put clericals behind the desk, got the cops to the street. So in theory, um, and I'm trying not to be a sexist, but let's just say there's things women are just not as well suited for. Um, there are plenty of jobs they're well suited for. So draft them, right? You don't have to put them, you don't have to put them on the front line. And, and so much of war is going to be fought, you know, remotely and weird stuff. And they can do that. So the, the thing that they may be not as good as maybe, I don't know, you know, 30 mile marches and who knows. And, and maybe they are as good, but, you know, they're not going to carry a body off the battlefield as well. Things like that. And mm -hmm. so and my big fear, by the way, is women on the front lines. My big fear is that I think guys are hardwired biologically to save the women and children. Right. That's, that's and, kind of men behave deep. differently when there's women involved. In that's right. That's right. So just watch what young men do when women are on the scene, they act like idiots. And I would fear that, um, that reckless behavior would ensue instead of well-reasoned behavior because there's some woman who needs saving and yep. and you don't want to get in that mess so um, hey i mean you place like one hot chick in like a platoon it's gonna it's oh gonna change God. the entire platoon because they're all gonna be trying well, to but, but, but it's not just that but if some chicks wounded out on the battlefield they, they, i think there's wiring in us that says saber more and even just i mean purely from like a more a moral front i i know there's like clerical positions and like you know you, they can like monitor or like Health, control drones and all this stuff but just medics, from a moral yeah. position like women are supposed to be the arbiters of life so right. like when you when you bring women into the fold and you send them out to the battlefield that's kind of telling you you're you don't really care much for the next generation you don't really care much well for... you know i i don't know if i sign off on that i i understand that argument and uh but I, I, there's plenty of jobs to be done, right? There's plenty of jobs to be done. So why not? And by the way, if we start drafting daughters, that war will end faster. You'll have a, yeah, you'll have a real anti-war movement for once in this country. Yeah. If that happens. Yeah. Yeah. No deferments. Get rid of deferments while you're at it. Yeah. You know, when, when Sherman marched on Atlanta, he wasn't an SOB. He realized that he to end that war, he had to bring the war to the South. He had to bring the reality of the war to the South. And 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 so he did. And 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 then then all of a sudden it's like, holy shit. My big my big fear, um I'm gonna call from a money manager actually. My big fear is that we are going to end up in some situation that we've not witnessed before where, where we are suffering. It's, I, I was watching a sci-fi movie the other night and a comet was heading for the earth, existential risk, right? It was breaking to pieces and dropping debris on everyone. They're scrambling and cars are blowing up, the usual thing. And I realized that's what Ukraine and Gaza looks like right now. 
And then I realized that we as a nation, if you go back to the Civil War along the battlefront, we witnessed that. But we as a nation have never, we've not witnessed mass starvation. Yeah, we've, not, the game. we've not, as I, I saw, I, I'm addicted to photo montages. One of those things, the, the clickbait where it says, you know, 40 pictures showing the realities of war was the thing. And I clicked on it. And it was pictures of guys laying in trenches and doing stuff in the dead, cold winter, Russian winter. Going, never, ever, ever would I want to find myself laying in the snow in the Russian winter fighting off some foe. I, I'm not tough enough for that. I don't have it in me. And, 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 and that's why, by the way, you don't go to war with Russia. They are tough. Those are the guys who can down a quart of vodka and stumble home. And, uh, and so, um, so I, I worry that the U S is long overdue to get a dose of reality and say, this is what suffering can look like. So the best way I posted a tweet yesterday. I, do you do Twitter much? I don't. I never notice. Do you do Twitter I, much? I have a small presence there. I just post my videos on there for the most part. Yeah, I follow um, me on Twitter, guys. At Capital Cosm. Go ahead. Exactly. Don't follow me. I got too many. Um, I, I I posted a tweet. Um, what the fuck was it? What the fuck was it? I had a point here, and I want I want to find that thing. I posted a tweet in which um. It's one of those tweets where you don't know what's about to happen. And all of a sudden I had like hundreds and hundreds of new followers. Um, hundreds and hundreds of new followers. Um, and I didn't understand what had happened. Oh, yeah, I posted a tweet in which I said, just had a long chat with one of the most prominent bear market money managers from the dot-com era. Okay. Now, it turns out it was David Tice and and David, who said I could mention anything he said. And he said, I'm, I'm getting out of the country. Now, to calibrate you, he actually is a, a founder and presumably part owner of a prepper community where it's all wired up, ready to go, off the grid, supplies, Navy SEALs on staff, you know, that sort of thing. And he's now decided he's not going to his prepper community. He's going off. He's leaving the country. Where, where is he he's, going? Well, he's not sure yet. He actually scouted out part of South America, and he said no. He, he went to Argentina because people say, "I'll oh, go to Argentina." He said it's just a shithole. I mean, he didn't use that word, but it, he talked about how he went to get cash out of the cash machine, and they gave him enough pesos that when he went to spend them, there was enough to get an Uber to the next destination. He said, that's all I could get on a cash machine with my ATM card. And um, so I think he's looking at New Zealand, which, you know, bucktooth neo-Nazi lady is now not in power. But it's scary that she ran, you know, Adhern ran New Zealand for a while. So if you had said, if you're going to leave the U.S., where would you go? Five years ago, I would have said um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Right. Those would have been sort of three. I wouldn't go to Europe because that's too much tribalism in Europe. Um, and then COVID shows up and that's where, that's where the, the, the authoritarianism ran rampant. And I go, okay, that, that just took the fun out of it. I think Canada is okay. I think if you got rid of, um, Trudeau and Christia Freeland, who I think is a junkie actually, um, did you ever watch her? I think she's a speed freak. Free, uh, Freeland. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she looks, you ever seen the videos of Adolf Hitler? Oh Jones yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen, yeah, her. She, I've seen her during the um, the trucker protests. Like she was not. I mean, she, she, but she sits there and she just wiggly, and you sit there and you go, "There's something wrong with that lady." Uh, she's also a, a total sort of Ukrainian Nazi by birth and by actions and stuff like that. Uh, totally World Economic Forum material. Everything's wrong with her. She's Victoria Newland of Canada, young global leader. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's worse than Trudeau because Trudeau's just clueless. So if you got rid of those two, Canada would pretty much go back to hockey and Molson beer. 
Um, and, that, and then Canada would be a great place to go. I should go up there fishing. Uh, I'd be fine to live up there. But, um, but what is he? What is he running from? Like exactly? Is it civil unrest? Like well, and, and he it's... wasn't clear. I. It was more of this this sense that the whole fucking thing is going to go south. And I he I didn't. I didn't drag that out of him. It's, it's, you know, when I do these podcasts, we often go through all the, all the risks. And by the time you're done, you're going, Oh, this is just a shit show that can't end well. And so it's, it's, it's a death by a thousand cuts. And you go, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving before I get the thousand cuts. I think, I think it's kind of, but, but he made a documentary with Dennis Quaid um, called grid down. Oh Dennis yeah. Yeah. Was, I, I yeah think Dennis was an, yeah. yeah. So David Tice, started that thing and hired Dennis, I think, to make it. And David used to run the Prudent Bear Funds. So I've known him ever so slightly through the Prudent Bear Fund for 25 years. And then I've gotten to know much better. We've spent some serious hours together at financial meetings and stuff that he shows up to. And um, and his second in command, a guy named Doug Nolan, I've had over for dinner and things like that. So I, I know the bears. I, I know the bears. Um, and I, I, there's just something has got him spooked. And 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 I posted and I got 2,500 likes. I go, what just happened? All I said was some unnamed guy ran for is running for the hills, right? And, and there were people who said, oh, yeah, that's bullshit. There's no content in that tweet. And I go, well, I, I was really just kind of, I don't know if you noticed, but I just tend to post thoughts. I get a thought. Someone said I'm like Andy Rooney or something. So I just posted a thought, right? It was just a thought. And, uh, you know, I expected 50 or 60 likes. People saying, oh, where's he going? You know, things like that. Uh, and that and it just went wild. I had one tweet that went to, I don't know, 35,000 or something. I didn't know that was coming. Then there's the guy who tweeted a picture of the shark coming out of the water looking mean. And he says a rare photograph of a shark stepping on a Lego. And it got a quarter of a million likes. You never know. Hawk twa girl, right? Hawk twa girl is making a ton of money now because of her hawk twa, right? If she can make that work, she's going to be like um, uh, that chick from Dr. Phil's show that that um, that said cash me on the outside. She was the one. Who yeah, was, I think she's making like $30,000 per appearance for like. Private yeah, she's things. making a fortune. And I don't know whether that was teed up at the start or she just was able to exploit opportunity. But. Um, I have literally made zero sense from my fame and fortune on the internet. Um, but we got to open you up a YouTube channel or, or a rumble channel, Dave. And just have I don't think I'd be a good host though. I don't think I'd be a good host or just like, just, uh, you know, Dave's rants when you just go in and just be, uh, just have at it for like an hour or so every week or every day or something, whatever you're comfortable with. Right. Like Andy Rooney. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Harvey. Now there was a guy who knew how to put together a story, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's some classics. There's some classics. But but yeah, what about you, Dave? What about you? Are you going to leave the country? No. Too hard. Too much work. If if you know if if we do have a serious problem like the grid goes down, it's only going to take a week for marauders to start wreaking total havoc. I mean, the, the thin veneer of civilizations going to peel away so quickly that you're not going to, you're not going to know what hits you. Yeah. And so I, I think, I think everyone ought to be a prepper. I think there ought to be, and it's a matter of degree. So if you're living in an apartment, good luck. You don't have the storage, but if you, if you own a house, you got the storage space. To me, it is inexcusable not to have a couple hundred pounds of rice, a couple of containers of Morton salt. You can even take rock salt for your driveway and just, bag of that but you cook the rice and have it taste okay you know buy a couple of things of bouillon or whatever you know you don't need nutrition what you need is calories because it would be a shame if you were gnawing your arm off after a month of the grid being down and then have the grid come back you know yeah, especially if you've got like garden space i mean don't waste that space on like well i'm, I'm not preparing lettuce. for life after the apocalypse i'm okay. what i'm preparing what i think y'all ought to prepare for is the kind of thing that will pass and you have to decide how long you're willing to sort of hedge against. So hedging for a month is easy. Hedging for six months, that takes some serious thought. And hedging for the society's never coming back 
is a totally different game, which I'm not going near. Right. Um, I've got um, probably enough medications that my wife and I can off ourselves. So no, yeah, I mean, after done. like a certain point, you just got to face your fate. You can't just I, I do not want to be, you know, the like these famous, I talk about the suffering, you know, the siege of Stalingrad, where there's pictures of people walking down the street and there's just bodies in the street. I, I don't want to be there. I just, that's, that's, I have a dotted line. I say below this dotted line, life's just not that precious to me. I, I've, I'm mm. 69 years old. You know, I, I probably, you know, got laid for the last time, you know, <laughs> I, I you know, ask any 69 year old guys, yeah, would you, I, some guy said, they said, when'd you have sex last? He said, Tuesday. And then he says, March 3rd. He says, 2002. <laughs> so so you know there's so just, the last time you got laid was on your 69th birthday right yeah don't 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 even go there um and and so there's just there's just i i i have plans for what to do in retirement but there's there my bucket list is I, i've pretty much checked off everything i need to check off so um so suffering is not on my bucket list that's the key right well, Dave, uh, well, what, what I've been doing on this show recently is I've been asking each guest to kind of give out like a book or two as a recommendation to the audience. So I'm going to leave the floor to you. Any books that you recommend? Okay. The, I give a general answer, and that is if you haven't done them, audiobooks first. Go with audiobooks. Everyone drives somewhere. My wife sends me to the store and back, and I, I don't mind going. She doesn't know why I'm so cooperative. It's because I turn on the car, I turn on the audiobook, and so it's like asking me to read in the solitude of my car where she can't ask me to do other things. Um, with that said, um, depends on the kind of books. I, I read all over the place. Um, if you like history, stuff like that, the the a company called The Teaching Company has trimester length books on every imaginable subject. It's called The Teaching Company. So you can search The Teaching Company or The Great Courses series. It's synonymous. I don't know which one they go by officially, but um, they're phenomenal. They're, they're university professors who are found and are phenomenal teachers. And they record a, about an 18 CD length book. And they used to cost 500 bucks. Then you get them on sale for 80 bucks. And now they're all cost 10 bucks on a on on amazon and so so they're dirt cheap um if for content if people are confused and confounded and demoralized what if you do a little bit of reading you'll discover that is those are the symptoms of rising authoritarianism confusion and demoralization and and in fact the demoralization as a subset of that is the authorities will gaslight the shit out of you so we not only have the bad guys doing bad shit, but they're not hiding it. So in some sense, they're trying to tear our souls out through our nose, like the brains of an Egyptian mummy through, the, mummy through their nose. And so my advice is to read books about authoritarianism. And then all of a sudden you go, that's what I'm seeing. That makes sense to me. And in that context, one of my favorites is... Um, the True Believer by Eric Hoffer, which I was on a Zoom call with a guy who said, oh, you got to read it. I did. And he was right. Um, um, the, the Psychology of Totalitarianism by um, Matthias Desmet. Um, um, Hannah Arendt's a tough read, but she writes about the Holocaust. And, and, and I like Michael Malice's The White Pill. I've been hyping that one pretty good. It's about what happened in the Soviet Union. We know 40 million people died under Lenin, Stalin. But you can't fathom how it happened. Malice describes how the Soviet society kind of consumed itself. It's, and, it's, and, and he doesn't overwhelm you with ruskiness, right? When I read about the Middle East, by the end, I, it's just, it's just, I'm fogged over because I don't, it's too foreign. And I've read so many books in the Middle East, none of them stick. Malice's book is very good, The White Pill. Um, I read Edward Bernays, 1926 or 28, I can't remember which, um, book called Propaganda. And in it, it's really funny. He says politicians have not yet figured out how to use propaganda. I go, well, apparently, apparently they did. They caught on. Um, he later on ended up working for the CIA. And so they caught on. Um, I read a lot of conspiratorial stuff now, like Operation Gladio about the drug trade and who's running it, things like that. And, um, um, 
uh, stuff like that. Uh, the book Chaos is very good. Um, it's about Charles Manson, and you find out Charles Manson was connected to the MK Ultra program, as was Timothy McVeigh, as was Jack Ruby, as was as was Ted Kaczynski. I think David Berkowitz. A um, lot of problem children were tied to the MK Ultra program, and I. I I'm fairly convinced now the CIA is just a crime syndicate that has a line as a line item in the U S budget, but is somehow a solo operation that just does what it wants. And I think there's guys in there who really care about the United States. I think there's guys in there who just view themselves as part of a global crime syndicate and they're self-funded and they've stolen some estimated $20 trillion. It's unaccounted for from the U S from the Pentagon budget. Um, and they, they pay for their dark op shit with the drug trade, the entire global drug trade, with the exception of the fentanyl, I think is, it's a triumvirate between the CIA, the Vatican and organized crime. So the Vatican banks it, organized crime gets it to the street and the CIA takes care of the geopolitical problems. Who's going to invade their turf, right? You get, you're going to go against those three. And so, yeah. and why, the exception why Vatican, is fentanyl. Why, why the Vatican? I think the Vatican, the church is two different things. One is the church, a religion, and the other is a church, um, a political institution. Uh, I, th I think the church probably has unimaginable wealth. It's been compounding their wealth for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, rich people have died and left all their wealth to the church. There's real estate all over Ithaca, even, that, that's owned by the Catholic church. And... Um, and I think that the Catholic Church, the financial political organization, is every bit as ruthless as any political organization. Gotcha. And, well, well, another thing that I've also implemented is um, I'm going to open the floor to you, Dave, to ask a question to my next guest. So to the question you can ask my next guest, what would it be? Who's your next, who's your next guest? Jay Martin. Jay Martin. First of all, say hi to Jay. I've done a number of podcasts with Jay. Um, ask Jay. Ask Jay what his what his lower limit for the S and P is in a serious downturn. Where does he have the S and P going to? And then, and then after he answers, tell him column says below two thousand. Tell him below 2,000. But get his answer first. Okay. Say, worst case scenario, how low can the S&P go? I think below 2,000 is fair value, historical fair value. Okay. So I actually think that if it really got ugly, it could go 1,200. And I think it should go to 2,000. I think 2,000 will bring us back to normal. It won't feel normal. 2008, 2009 got back to fair value, but not lower. Okay, I'll let him know, and, and I'll so, let you know what so he says. Ask him what he says. What's his worst case scenario? Because most people say, "Ah, oh, twenty percent correction." I go, "You're a pussy." Uh, you know, when these guys say, "Oh, we could have a ten percent correction between now and the end of the oh year," I go, "Of course God. we could. We could have a ten percent correction by Thursday." What are you talking about? What kind of call is that? And it's not a correction. It's just a. That's just a flutter. Yeah. Correction right now, minimum correction right now, minimum correction be 50%. And it can't bounce back because then it's not corrected if it bounces back. Right. It's got to go down and stay down. It's like saying, oh, yeah, I lost 300 pounds. Oh, the next year I gained it all back, but it was really good to lose 300 pounds. No, it wasn't. You gained it all back. Yeah. Well, I have so, a question for you, Dave, from my previous guests. I had Joe Brown from Here See Financial on. I don't know if you know who he is, I, but he had. Yeah. Okay. So he has a question for you. His did question, he know he was asking me or was this a general yeah. question? No, he, okay. he did. He did. So his question was, I would, I would ask him in a world of, or at least in a nation of increasing government overreach and tipping over into potential tyranny. What is the most effective way to improve your life? Would it be a fight back? Um, 
that could include mm. talking, uh, talking about things, you know, making people aware of the issues. Um, B, just completely ignoring it and saying, I can't control this at all. So I'm going to keep my head in the sand and just improve my life regardless. Like there's things outside of my control. I'm just going to focus on making money and making the life better for myself and those around me. Or is it C, to just exit the system? If you know how bad it is and you disagree with it, go somewhere else that's better. Depends on age. I was once told at Y2K, some guy said, don't do something that requires a disaster to be okay. To me, fleeing the country sort of is in that category. You can look up five years to have been living in Argentina. The U.S. is fine. I could have been living where I lived before I had a nice house. What am I doing, right? Um, I, I, it depends on your age. So I encourage young people to ignore the shit because they've got to learn how to make robots and code and raise families and things like that. And it'll, it'll swallow them too young. If I got into this shit when I was young, I would not have achieved what I achieved as a chemist, for example. I think on the other hand, at my age where the risk, the real risk to me is minimal, absolutely minimal. I saw God sod give a talk at Cornell one day and, he convinced me that although I speak out a lot, that I could do better. And so I think you speak uh, speak truth to power whenever you can. And and that's why I called out the Democratic Party this morning with my you sex of garbage. You could go with Kennedy and you chose not to, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, I'm trying to speak truth to power. And that's why I do all the podcasts and stuff. And so uh, everyone can speak truth to power. Um you don't have to pick a fight that's that's that'll cause you to get hit by gambler's ruin. So if if you if you draw an inside straights all the time, you eventually you're gonna lose easily. And so you gotta you gotta live to fight another fight. And so if speaking truth to power means you're gonna lose your job and your family, don't speak truth to power, right? Save your ammo for it for a more winnable fight where the odds are in your favor better. But then, you know, as Saad said, you know, talk to friends behind closed doors, chat with them, right? Try to try to get them to ponder whether climate change is real, which I believe it is not. Um, yeah, just normal. Um, and and try to spread the word sort of one one pixel at a time. OK, well, Dave, it's been a pleasure. Where can people find you? Under my desk. Um, they can find me on Twitter. I, I do try to answer emails. Um, try not to write long ones. I'm getting a lot of them. Um, and uh, I, my pin tweet is my year in review, which I write every fall, which is a really cathartic experience, uh, almost to the point of being unpleasant. Um, but otherwise, Twitter. I'm pretty active on I'm hyperactive on Twitter, actually. I'm a tweet man. Yeah, that last and, uh, tweet got 607,000 views. So, Which tweet was? The one you, you uh, referred to. Oh, uh, the, the oh it Price. did? Yeah, 600,000 views. Oh, my God. Yep. What does a view mean on Twitter? I think it's like a five second impression or something like that. So where someone had it open for five seconds or something like Maybe. that. Maybe I don't. I don't know exactly what. I mean, t that's the the usual criteria that's that's used to define but, an. Impression. But there's got to be some evidence of like clicking on it or something or. No, no, no. Just just an impression. So just as long as they scroll past it for some amount of time. Where it was. Do they have to screen? stall? Does there have to be evidence that the I don't tweet know. I don't know. I, I, I'm gonna have to I'd look have to, that like, up. talk to the X team about that. I don't. I don't know what they what metrics. Yeah, are. yeah, um, yeah. That tweet was controversial because some people thought I. They said, "Well, you know, that's like telling me you're." Well, your it sounds like you're getting it. inside information. That's why, because because you're like, I, well, got I was just giving on. an example of a smart yeah. guy who's heading out of town who's just yeah. saying I've had it right and. I, but you kept it vague, like you didn't mention who the person was, so you let people kind right. of like make up their own scenario in their head. Well, the funny one was someone guessed wrong, and I said someone guessed Fleck, Fleckenstein, and I tagged Fleck on my answer and said, uh, "said no, it's not Bill," um, and I tagged him, 
And I said, but if you ask Bill back in the dot com era, who was most often brought on CNBC to beat around and try to embarrass because they were bearish, he would get the guy. And Fleckenstein popped back saying, well, that would be David Tice. And he was dead right. And then Cahotis chimes in, cantankerous rat bastard, and uh, who I really like. Um, he says, ah, oh, Tice, Tice is a lightweight. <laughs> and, and they just like Chanos, just like Chanos. And I'm going, Jesus, Mark, <laughs> you're, just, you're such an ornery bastard. <laughs> Uh, he's got a standing offer to join me for dinner on my deck, and he keeps saying he's going to come. But so far, so far, he's ghosting me. <laughs> oh, well, that's a shame. We'll end it on that note So uh, then, Dave. So if you guys enjoy this content, comment down below. Go, Dave, go. Go, Dave, go. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all.